Well, hello, lovely listeners. Today we have the wonderful Mick Butler. Um, Mick came into my world in May 2024, so literally only a few months ago. And the reason he came into my world was because I've been um, a bit of a rebel and decided that um, our governments and our councils and anything government related, uh, they don't do what we think they're supposed to do. And so I've challenged a few things along the way and um, got myself into a bit of bother, which I'm not going to go into in too much detail here. But I was introduced to Mick through another guy that I'd met as a result of all of this. And um, bless him, he was on holiday when he was asked to give me a call or send me a text or whatever it was. And um, I was up up against it timeline, uh, time-wise, sorry. And uh, yeah, bless him, he just kept messaging me. And we spoke a couple of times when you were in Spain. And I was like, who is this guy? Jesus Christ, he's on holiday. Why... Why is he giving me so much time and he's never even met me? <laughs> that is genuinely what I was thinking at the time. But mm -hmm. I was very, very grateful um, because I was uh, in a quite a fearful place at the time. And, and Mick was amazing and just made me feel a lot calmer. And he's got a lot of knowledge. And so, so Mick really is somebody... Um, is one of the millions of people that have woken up over the last few years in terms of what's going on in the world. Um, certainly my great awakening was 2020. There was, there was stuff before that, but certainly the great awakening was 2020, like a lot of people. <clears throat> and I don't know when mix was, but you suddenly realize that um, the world is not as we thought it was. Everything we've been taught and told is pretty much a load of bollocks. There's a, a main narrative that an agenda that's been running the world for a long time. And um, we just didn't realize it for for most of our life. And then the COVID, scamdemic, whatever you want to call it, uh, woke a lot of people up. And I know it had an impact on Mick as well. So that is what that is part of what we're here to to, to talk about because Mick is somebody that's definitely not settling for the bullshit and for injustice and lies and fraud and everything else that's that is going on in the world um he's too honest and he's too uh, uh too good a person to let all that go over his head and he's he's more than prepared to stand up and be counted so welcome mick thank you so much for giving me your time on this friday evening no problem <laughs> oh, thank you because i know you've been already been on a podcast today yeah so, so um, our listeners or viewers, um, they always like a bit of a backstory. So it, it go back as far as you want, Mick. But in terms of obviously the, the theme of this is not settling and you're definitely not settling for the status quo. Mm. So give us a little bit of a backstory as to what brought you to where you are right now, I suppose. Um, well, I've always been the type of, uh, type of person to do my own thing. Mm. Well, I've never been... Uh, a sheep as such you know following the crowd um but I, when i go for something i'll go for it um so for example when i was at school um i didn't really enjoy school i enjoyed the mates and the laughs and the football but i hated the learning and all the bullshit with the teachers being strict and all that sort of stuff um but i always wanted to be a soldier that was mm -hmm. like a childhood dream um and from the age of 14, I put myself into a bit of a training regime. And then by the time it came to the, um, the point where I could join the forces, which was 16, uh, I was in there pretty much straight from school. What was it about being a soldier for you? Um, it's just boys and their toys, isn't it? You know, I used to I used to um, always play army, you know, running, running around the streets, pretending you shoot people and stuff, you know, with your mates. And I remember my uncle bought me these uh, combat and survival books uh, and they went from one to 50, whatever it was. But um, the first 30 weeks was all about the Marines, uh, Royal Marine training. And uh, from week one, it just got me. You know, every day was a challenge. Uh, it was quite varied. Um, and I thought, yeah, I could do that. And I remember when I said to my dad, um, I'm going to join the Marines. He says, oh, I don't know. It's a man's world, that is, son. <laughs> um, bear in mind, I think I was about 15 when I said it to him. Um, 
And then when I went to the careers office for the first time, um, the the guy at the Navy um, officer asked me to jump on the bar, do a pull-up, and I couldn't even manage one. And he said, mm. listen, come back come back when you can do six, and then we'll have a chat. So I went back a month later, and I squeezed out six. <laughs> and uh, and he, he, I started to get a bit of a rapport with the guy, and I kept going and saying, right, I've reached this tank, what shall I do now? And... Um, I had a lot of respect for him, but I think he liked me. Like, he, I was under his wing sort of thing. And uh, I got booked in for this intelligence test, which I was absolutely dreading, because I weren't that great at school. And uh, so I did this. I remember sitting down, and it was only me in this room. And he's come in, he's giving me the test papers. Uh, and he said, just take your time. I'll come in when your time's up. So I've gone through it, and I know I was struggling. I was thinking, there's no way I'll pass this. And he asked me to do it in pencil. And uh, I didn't think of it at the time, but afterwards, when he came, he took my paper off me and then I waited for about 15 minutes and he come back in and he says, how do you think you got on? And I said, well, I struggled quite a bit with it, to be fair. And he says, well, I'm pleased to say you passed. And I was just happy that I'd passed. But I I seriously believe he helped me out, get through on that intelligence test. Um, so, yeah, so, and then I went into the Marines at 16. I was the youngest of my troop out of 54 lads. Uh, and you get to meet various different people from all backgrounds, Geordies, Scottish, people from London, all over the country. Obviously, different attitudes and um, accents and culture, um, and I absolutely loved it. Um, at the end of the training, at the 54, I think there was about 11 lads left altogether, which is not a big number, but that's the norm. Um, and I spent about six, nearly six years in there, and I left because I had kids really young, um, and I wasn't really seeing the kids because I was away all the time. Um, so I left for family purposes. Uh, and then when I left, I, I got into a factory job. Now, going for the Royal Marines from 16, and obviously it gets instilled in you, the discipline and how you live your life and stuff like that. Uh, and I went into a factory and I just couldn't get on with the culture in the factory, with the way they joke and have the crack and all that. I've, I mean, I think in the first year I had three fights in the hour. Oh, Three fights in the first year. How I managed to stay in that job, I don't know. Um, but I ended up, after about two years, somebody put my name down to be a shop steward in there. Um, and I was only, I think I was only about 23, something like that. Um, so I got elected to be a shop steward because I was quite gobby with the management. And um, I did that for about a year. And then I got appointed a senior steward over the whole factory for the Transport and General Workers Union. So then I ended up my own office, computer and all that. And I've never, I, that's how I learned how to do computers because they sent me on courses. Yeah. And then obviously I did a bit of uh, a bit of law in the workplace uh, and stuff like that, how to do pay negotiations and, and whatnot. So my last few years in there was pretty, pretty interesting. But I left because the car manufacturing industry was on a dive. Mm. I thought if I just stay in here, I'm gonna end up leaving, and I don't know any. I don't know where to go. I don't know what else to do. So because when I was in the forces, I managed to get all my HGV licenses. I thought right, I'll um, I'll put that in my experiences with with the driving, in with some of the training. So I used to run a football uh, team probably for about ten years, and I was always good at teaching the kids football. And I just thought well, teaching plus driving put my name down for driving instructor to see how I get on uh, and it went really well for me I was self-taught really um, up until my part three once I did my part three for the driving instructing I was asked by Red Driving School to uh, jump on and do a franchise with them but I just ended up going on my own I got so I think I got about 16 hours while I was in my current job and then I thought just bit the bullet and I just put my notice in to leave jumped on the driving and then I was doing that for um Till virtually present day. So, how long ago did you start the driving? Uh, I was thirty-four, so about seventeen years ago. Okay, so you've been doing it a long time then. Yeah, yeah, doing it a while, yeah. Uh, and I, and I, I really enjoy the job because I meet different people all the time, um, and people think oh, I must be boring just sitting there. But because yeah. you see different people all the time, it's different conversations. Obviously, when you first get them, um, you know it's. You've, you know, you've, you've got to be talking about your teaching and getting up to a good standard. But once you're at a good standard, it's just like having a passenger and you're just getting them road experience yeah, and getting up to test standards so you have more chats and things like that, you know. 
Have um, you ever had uh, any major crushes with any students? well, in the first year, um, my it's the worst accent. I've, I mean, I've been hit by a coach before, by the way. I, when, when I was in the forces and I passed my test because I did it in a in a, a HGV in the forces. The first crash I had was the um, M5 coming up on the Exeter Junction on a slip road. And there was loads of cones. First time I'd ever been on a motorway. And I'm coming up the slip road. Two massive giveaway signs. Didn't even recognise them. <laughs> you oh. just passed your test. Yeah, and I just passed my test. Literally about 10 days. Wow. And I've got a mate next to me here. And we're coming up this slip road. And it's basically two big massive giveaway things. And I just thought I could just come on into the lane that was present, but there was traffic coming down it, but not at the time. And as I'm coming on, there's a massive HGV class one coming down. And I didn't even see him till he was in the side of my door. Wow. Shoving me over to the hard shoulder. Oh. And then I couldn't get out of the vehicle because all the door was caved in. And he had to carry on because of the cones. So, yeah. And then um, I remember my mate saying, what the fuck? Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> having a go at me and then the sergeant turned up and then he's having a go at me and then there was like a good cop bad cop one sergeant saying to you well listen we need to get him back out on the road straight away so it doesn't knock his confidence and all this sort of thing um so that was my worst one in the forces and then the worst one with the driving um was coming on to the m6 junction three from bedworth going down towards rico and he sort of bends round a little and we, me and this pupil, we just come round. We just stop behind two cars. There's a gap come up. Like I didn't think they could go on the motorway. Yeah, it's just the M6 motorway junction, not actually on the motorway. Oh, so okay, like, got you. Yeah, yeah. So it's just on the A Trouble Four. So um, we're just coming around. We stop behind these two cars. I've seen this coach coming in the background, and um, the two cars went, and then we've come up to line. As we come around, we've had to stop because another car coming. Now, once this car passes, we're in. We're into another gap. But this coach driver must have seen all of us starting to move. And he's focused on that gap that I'm looking at, while well, my pupil was looking at. And I just looked at him on mirror. And this coach just overshadowed and went whack, smashed us straight in the back, shoved us into the uh, roundabout. Luckily, we didn't get hit. We shoved us into the roundabout. And my tailgate was up in the air. Ripped the car off. The car was only just, a year, just over a year old. It's a Peugeot 307. It ripped it off. Uh, she went... Um, she went to George Elliott on a spinal board, my pupil. Oh, bloody hell. Yeah, it was pretty bad. Pretty bad. But I've had about five or six accidents while I've been doing, while I was doing that driving instructing job. Um, and they're all rear enders. Never, I've never had a pupil have a crash. Not one. Not one of my pupils have actually had a crash themselves, you know, their own fault. It's always been rear end crashes into us. Wow. People are just impatient, aren't they? Well, yeah, when they see the L sign, they're like, oh, for God's sake. I know. Yeah. I know. Learn a morphia, morphia, and it's like, oh, I've got to get round them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, then they uh, create chaos. Yeah. yeah, that's it. So, so yeah, so, uh, yeah. And then um, going back to what you were saying before about how we met. Yeah. Um, obviously, same as you, 2020, can't go out and work, lockdown. So once I decorated the whole house and nothing else to do, bit bored, start listening to stuff. Um, and I heard about uh, David Icke, mm. uh, listened to a couple of his things, and he was talking about like this pandemic years and years ago. Mm. Yeah, And I was very much a TV, you know, come home, have me dinner, watch a bit of telly, um, and listen to the bullshit. And it's like a spiral. And like you say about being unsettled, um, you know, now I'm starting to do stuff that I don't normally do. And I suppose it's a bit of a change of character. And people around you start noticing, don't they? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Even like it got to a point where I'm telling people stuff that I've learned and they look at me like I'm some sort of idiot. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Um, and, you know, I'm telling people, don't take the jab, don't take the jab. It's this, that and you're about. And I, I followed Robert Malone a lot. Yeah. And he was the inventor of the mRNA technology. Yeah. Uh, so I followed him a lot and some of these podcasts in America where these guys were re well-renowned individuals in their field. Mm. And now all of a sudden they've changed to being conspiracy theorists because they're not going with a narrative on the telly. Exactly. So straight away for me, that's a red flag. And for other people, they're just like, oh, yeah, you must be a conspiracy. They don't look into it themselves. No. Um, and I was basically telling people about the jab and stuff. And, and obviously the, the biggest um, con 
which people fell for, was the fact, well, if you don't get the jab, you can't go on holiday. And I know so many people that had the vaccine because they couldn't go on holiday. And I just had the mindset, well, for one, what right, what rights have you got telling me when I can and can't travel over a vaccine? So yeah. I just bit the bullet. I thought, right, I ain't going away then. Exactly I'm going to buy myself a caravan and just yeah. tour around England. And that's what I ended up doing. I, I just resigned to the fact that I was never going to go abroad again. Bear in mind, I've been going abroad since I was probably about 24 uh, every single year. Mm. Um, I never went abroad as a kid, probably like most people my my, my age. Um, but the last 10 years up to that pandemic, I was going away two or three times a year. Mm. I, was, I was happy just to say, well, okay, I'm not going away then. Me too, I, yeah. Yeah, I'm not going to be forced into having a, a jab to, to go somewhere. I mean, straight away, when... It, the young ones probably fell for it more so because they haven't been around long enough. Exactly. And they wanted their, you know, uh, my son is now 25, but he was 20 when this kicked off. And a lot, most of his mates went and got it um, because they wanted their boys' holidays. They wanted to enjoy their early 20s. And 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 I get it, but, you know, and Jake, Jake started saying to me, um, oh, and he wound me up a couple of times. I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it. And I literally, the look I gave him, I said, you over my dead body, are you yeah. getting it? And, um, and he was like, I'm only joking. I'm only joking because he understood it. He saw it. And, but all, a lot of his mates did it for the holidays. And he was just like, I ain't doing that mom. You know, he, he, he got it quite quickly. So. Yeah. Yeah. I remember one of my good friends who I knocked about with for like 10 years, nearly 10 years up to 2020. And uh, we were sat in the tub and I said, because um, I'd found out quite early that this thing was, it was, you know, it was a pandemic. Yeah. And the vaccines were already there. They they just had to get yeah, through exactly. the bit of bullshit, yeah. scare yeah. tactics for them to implement that. And I remember saying to him, listen, don't take the vaccine. It's it's a buy, you know, it's a buy a weapon. Don't take it. It's only going to mess people's bodies up. And then he looked at me and said, look, I don't want to talk about it now. Mm. And then he ended up going, well, I think he had two or three just so he could go to America. And it's sad, really, because even now he, he regrets having it done. And I've got a few friends like that that regret having it done. Yeah. But around that time, I felt like, and probably like a lot of people around that time, you feel like you're getting starting to get isolated yeah. and you haven't really got your friends around you. And now you're not being invited to, you know, this party or that group gathering. And there's a lot of group gatherings that I did go to, Um uh, pre prior to uh, twenty twenty, which I know, which I'll never get an invite now. I never see them anymore, and, and that's why I'm fine. You know, I'm a you know I'm a, I'm a I'm a grown bloke. I can handle it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. If, if you're a true friend, it wouldn't have been. It doesn't matter. They have their views. I have my views, and it shouldn't stop a friendship. No, not a real friendship anyway. No. I mean, so yeah, so twenty twenty sort of woke me up on that front. Um, but then it leads you down to other little rabbit holes. What do you mean the banks don't lend money? <laughs> yeah. What do you mean you don't have to pay your TV license? <laughs> what are you on about? Seven trent water of poison in the water. <laughs> what do you mean gas and electric's already paid? Do you know what I mean? What do you mean 11.2 mortgages in the UK are fraudulent? You know? Um, and I remember when I watched, I think it was. Uh, you haven't mentioned the cabal and adrenochrome. Yeah, that's heavy stuff, though, isn't it? I know, I know. We'll leave that's, that for another time. That's heavy stuff, and that's not stuff really uh, we're sort of fighting, if you like. No, not in um, the group that we're in, no. No, that's it. We're not really fighting. But I remember with the lockdowns when they're being dead tyrannical with it, and then you had these London marches and stuff. Um, and I remember the first one I went on, it was massive. And then I think the third or fourth one that I went on down London, it was, it, I'd never seen anything like it in my life. It was absolutely huge. Absolutely huge. And I remember on that march, uh, which I think what ch changed, it, it changed the uh, the lockdowns and the government sort of could see that too many people were waking up and they started relaxing and everything. And I remember going on that march and I'd be part of the me and I, met, I remember sitting down and I must have sat down about half an hour and the people were still going past Still going past, still going past, and then I eventually joined back in the crowd again, and it was it was still huge, you know. It was absolutely crazy, but crazy dark times uh, during COVID. But there's so many people, the information's there, um, the truth has come out, 
Matt, even what Matt Hancock said um, in his emails that's come out to light, you know, when are we going to release the next variant to scare the pants off them? Mm. You know, that's that's public knowledge. Uh, people don't seem fuming about it. You know, the parties that they were having in Turn Downing Street, knowing that we were all locked down. And if, you know, somebody died close to your family, you know, you had to sort of flip a coin to see who's going to go to the funeral between your brothers and sisters and your family members. And they're having parties because they all knew it was bullshit. Did you see he, the, um, you must have done that. I mean, it was, it went viral, didn't it? The um, the two sons and the mum who'd lost their dad and they were all separated in the thing. And the 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 son, because the mum was like inconsolable, pulled up his chair and put his arm around her. And then the Nazi funeral director, I shouldn't call him that because he obviously, you know, believed it all and all the rest of it. And he was following orders. But I couldn't do what he did. It's empathy, isn't it? Yeah, it's like somebody's upset. You're going to go and put your arm around them. But because their six foot shite rule was in, he basically dragged them apart and said, you have to sit there. And it was like this is a, a funeral, I, I, you know, and that's how that's how loon that was the lunacy that we were witnessing at that time. And I mean, we're still witnessing a lot of lunacy right now in different ways, but that's how it got people. People, you know, I, my own personal story. I don't know whether they're ever going to listen to this, um, but it was my mom's. So my best friend from the age of four. Um, totally different hook line and sinker da 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 da, da. um seemed okay to begin with then it wasn't okay then we had an awkward conversation and then it was my mum's 80th in uh 21 and uh i was doing a surprise afternoon tea for her and so obviously she was included but so were her parents all you know friends of family etc and her mum said to me um well we won't we won't be there at, at, at we'll we'll see your mom on her birthday we won't be there because you know you're you and your brothers uh, haven't had the vaccine have you and uh, yeah and i was just like i wasn't i wasn't um shocked because i knew how hook line and sinker they were mm. but but it was the sheer fucking disappointment i've known you since i was 4 years old yeah and if you're vaccinated, then you're protected, right? <laughs> um, so why is it such a such an issue? But yeah, so that really that's what vaccines me. do, right? Vaccines protect you. I know, I know, but it gutted me. It gutted me for my mom because it was her 80th, mm. and the irony was, the weekend before they went to an event, presumably full of vaccinated people, uh, because they went to the event, and they got COVID. So uh, they couldn't come out anyway, even if they even if they said they were coming to the afternoon part tea party, they wouldn't have been able to come because they both got COVID from the week before. Yeah. Fully vaccinated. I mean, the, the, the timeline tax was was quite short in terms of the lie. Take the vaccine, save granny. If you yeah. take the vaccine, you won't you won't catch it. You won't transmit it. And then it then when people realize, well, I've had the vaccine and they're saying I've got COVID. Oh, well. You know, take the vaccine. You might get COVID, but you won't. You won't pass it on. <laughs> yeah. And then it was take the vaccine, and you'll, you you know you won't go into hospital. You know, it, it, the timeline was very short to the point where, well, you can have the vaccine and you you still get COVID. Yeah, and it's not going to do point. anything. Yeah. Well, come and get a booster. Come and get another one. Come and get another one. I mean, I was telling my parents not not to take the vaccine from the get go. Unfortunately, my mother listened to my oldest brother. And she's she's had the vaccines and she's been ill. Yeah. You know, my dad's when my dad's had it and I was telling him, um, and he's had since he's had the vaccine, I know he's old, and you can say, Well, he's probably his age you would have had it anyway. Well, I don't think so. But since he had the vaccine, he's had cancer twice. Oh really? Yeah, he's had a heart attack. He had a major heart attack um not Christmas just gone, Christmas before. You know, and that's all since he had having these vaccines. Before then he you know, he wasn't having any heart attacks. He didn't have cancer. And then we know now it's a thing. that like, Turbo cancers are a big thing. Yeah. It's what they're putting these vaccines. 100% it is. I mean, I'll yeah. never, ever trust the, the the medical industry again, ever. You know? And I think a lot a lot of people, 
especially in our movement, we're all heading back towards that holistic yeah. stuff. And even listening to people who are saying we can cure cancer. And I think, well, you know, uh, Big Mick in our group, yeah. Well, he had stage four cancer and he was told he'd only got X amount of uh, months to live. Uh, and there was a lad in Derby uh, who, who he knows. And he was saying, Mick, let me get you on this stuff. And it was to do with, um, it wasn't CBDC, but it was a strong version of that stuff. I forget what you call it now. But he went on this stuff and it was funny, you know, the story for that, because he was, when he went to his mates, he'd give him all these syringes full of this stuff. Um, and he was told to take um one mil every other day right so he goes home and he has he has the shot or whatever he did whatever he had to do with it but he had the shot and then he's out cold for like 48 hours he'll tell you the story he was out cold for 48 hours but when he's come round, he's like what the hell's happened to me um and he thought right okay it must be normal maybe this is the first time i had it and then he did it again and then he got in touch with his mate. And he said, this stuff's wiping me out. I can't function. And he said, well, it shouldn't be wiping you out, mate. He said, plus, I don't think this is going to last me, you know, uh, three months. He says, I've, I've already gone through two already. And he went, what, two syringes? And he went, yeah. He said, mate, there's 10 mil in each syringe. <laughs> so where he was supposed to be having one mil, he had two 10 mil shots. Wow. No wonder it knocked him out. <laughs> Jesus Christ. But you I, know, did not, I did not know he had cancer. So... Obviously. Yeah, he was terminal. Yeah, he sold his car, give it, give the money to his missus and all that sort of stuff. And yeah, it make would tell you he thought he was, he was done. But after that three months of doing that routine, his mate gave him, he went back to the doctors, cancer free. Wow, cancer free. It just shows you, doesn't it? Because I've been seeing stuff um, that parasites cause cancer, and I don't know, you know, I don't know whether that's true or not. But there's a lot of evidence that's coming out to suggest it, and. And also we all fear the big C words, you know, and the only treatment is chemo and radiotherapy and all that bullshit and, and, and surgery. And I've always known that to be wrong because it, it poisons your whole body and your fucking hair falls out. That yeah. can't be a good thing. Right. And it's um, it's radiotherapy that the clue is in what the hell it's called. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So I've always said I would never have chemo or radio. I would always look for an alternative, whether it be watching well, I'd like to say watching comedy films all day long, but I don't trust any of the goddamn comedians <laughs> or actors anymore. Yeah. So it, it takes the joy out of it, apart from Robin Williams. I think he was a good guy. But um Alistair Williams. Robin. Oh, Robin Williams. Yeah. Oh, of course, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think he was a good guy and yeah. a very troubled guy. But um, well, so we're told. But I think he was. Anyway, so who knows what the truth is. But I was um, even told he's not dead, but Hey, what, Robin? Yeah, I was told he is not dead. I've yeah. been told a lot, a, lot of, a lot of these. A lot of them are not dead, are they? Like but Princess we'll see, Diana, we? Prince, uh, MJ, Elvis. Yeah. Anyway. Imagine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know. Um, okay, so I think, yeah, I think we've got the point across that we both did not believe from 2020 what was going on. So in terms of... Um, where it took you next because obviously you weren't doing the jabs you were trying to educate the people around you the same yeah. as i was you were probably quite bullish about it the same as i was and yeah. people are on their own journey and um in the end you have to respect that even though you know that they're giving themselves potentially a death shot yeah um so what so what happened next then when did the whole legal lawful fraudulent stuff start to come into your world i would say it was probably um well you know during covid they somebody set up these stand in the park so i think it originated yeah. from australia i think yeah uh for like-minded people that weren't believing the narrative and there was a stand in the park at uh, the memorial park in coventry um, and I thought, right, I'll go over there and see what these people are all about. So I went over there and met, you know, little Keith, who comes to the group. So I met Keith, uh, Big Lee, uh, Carol, um, etc. Um, and real genuine, nice people. And I remember meeting this this uh, Asian lady. She was on about, like, um, she was going to court for a PCN. And I'd never heard of that before. You get a PCN, you pay it. What's, yeah. You know, what are you doing? And uh, they started saying, you know, it was it wasn't uh, lawful. This that and the other, 
and then uh, just, for the list, also, just for the listeners, we're on about parking charge notice. Park so, charging, uh, yeah. park, parking <laughs> charge notice. Yes. Parking yeah. So if you notice. if you if you run out of time or if you forget to put a ticket on, you obviously get a fine, right? So. Yeah. Yeah. So so she was basically fighting this in the court, and um, I remember this lad saying uh, in the conversation, he says, um, "I've just done a course where you know they'll teach you how to get rid of that." Um, and then I remember going back the following week and basically she had to pay. And I think she it was ridiculous um, sum of money. Where if she had paid the 40, 60 quid, whatever it was, now she's paying like, I think it was three, four hundred pound. Because it went to court, yeah. So it went to court, court costs and all that. Right. So, uh, I mean, it was probably the, the business court, you know, Northampton or whatever. Um, but anyway, so... I said to this guy, what was this course you're on about? How you, get, how you get out of PCNs? And he said, it's called the Sovereign Project over in Leicester. And he says, I'll teach you all sorts. You know, you know, they'll teach you about um, your gas and electric's free. I said, gas and electric's free? So I'm scratching my head a bit here. Um, but I was intrigued, intrigued about it. And they were starting a new course. So I thought, right, got the address off him. Got myself over at Leicester. I think it was Thursday night, so I did it on Wednesday night. So I went over um, and listened. I missed the first week, so it was the second week I got into. And the presentation, I was just gobsmacked. And I was thinking, this can't be true. You know? And then you know, the room's full of these people. Probably someone who, like, comes to ours. And for the first time, they're, they're like, Are these nutters or what? Do you know what I mean? So, and it was funny because... I got into about week five, week six, something like that, into the course, and I ended up getting a, a parking charge notice. <laughs> so I thought, right, I'll start implementing what, what I've been learning. And I always remember Peter Stone saying, um, you know, he who leaves the battlefield first loses by default. So in other words, you just keep putting the questions in, you know, and... And that's basically what I did. Um, kept, I kept asking the questions. They weren't answering it. So I stayed on point saying, listen, you haven't answered this, but you said this. So then I questioned that. So, you know, maybe four questions. By the end of my last notice where they gave in, there, there was probably 12 or 13 questions. So I thought, actually, this stuff works. So I ended up getting away with a PCN at the time. That, that was my mindset. Or I got away with it. Yeah, but now my mindset, they're getting away with it. Yeah, people don't know, so it's these corrupt businesses, they're getting away with it on our ignorance because we don't know what the law is mm. or our constitutional law. So, so that was a piece, and then I had a speeding, uh, a speeding fine for going down London Road at 38 and a 30. So, obviously, you get the, the form which you have to fill in, and I always, you know, I was told on that course, don't fill it in, you write your own. Don't write in black writing because that's writing representing the dead. Don't yeah. write in capital letters, etc., all that sort of stuff. So obviously I'm doing it with the conscious that this is what I've been taught, but the the belief isn't secure with, in my mind yet because I haven't been successful. Yeah, so I'm still, there's still a lot of doubt there. Is this going to work? Yeah. Uh, so I went through that process with the speeding fine and they threatened to give me a thousand pound fine and six points. And at the time... That's my business done. You know, I can't work if I have six points and a thousand pound fine. Um, so I stuck with it and kept doing the questions, kept sending it to Craig Guilford, the chief of uh, chief constable of West Midlands uh, Police. And in the end, they just gave in. So when they didn't write back to me, I, I think it was about a month and a half. I then wrote them another notice just saying, you haven't responded to my last notice, but I'm going to give you another seven days to respond. And if I don't hear anything, then I'll, I shall deem the matter's been concluded. And I never, ever heard anything. Job done. And you never got the points? Never got the points, never got a fine, nothing. So so then, obviously, that gave me real confidence then. And that, so what these are teaching me, this Sovereign Project, it must be true. So then I started, um, well, I didn't challenge the TV uh, licence because I don't watch TV anymore since 2020. It's very rare I'll ever watch any telly. And I certainly don't watch BBC or live TV. So I ended up um, sending the TV people a, a notice just saying, um, if you feel there's any contract between us, I'm giving you 28 days that it's ending. Um, 
I'll no longer require your services. Um, and I'll be cancelling my, de my direct debit in 28 days, whatever. After I never heard from them. After the 28 days, I cancel my di direct debit. Three days later, I got something through the door. You know, tell me what, why, why have I cancelled the direct debit, not paying for the TV license? So then I sent him another notice back saying, um, please refer to my first notice dated such and such. Um, and for your information, it's my common law right to inform you that your implied rights of access to my property has been removed. So in other words, I don't want no one coming around chatting to me about it. And funny enough, they wrote back to me saying, we uphold your common law right of implied rights of access. However, you're not allowed to watch your TV on this, 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 this. Fine, whatever. And that's been filed and yeah, I've never heard from them since. That's interesting because um, so on two points there. So I did get six points and a thousand pound fine um, for a speeding thing. I basically said I wasn't driving, don't know who was driving. And I didn't know enough. This was back in um, 21. I didn't know enough, still don't know enough, but um, <laughs> I didn't know enough. And so, yeah, so that's what where I've been stuck with. And I've often thought, um, because obviously legally, whatever that means, they'll yeah. be they're gone in three years anyway, but this fine still stands because I never paid the fine. And I thought I should I should rechallenge that and basically, but I don't I because I've got <laughs> other fish to fry. Going on, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I haven't. So it'd be interesting to know um what you did on that. But um on the second thing you just mentioned, which was I've lost my train of thought. TV. TV. Um, I ended up getting a refund on my TV license and just stopped paying it. And we've had a couple of people come round. I've never, I've never answered the door. It's always been Jake, and Jake just says we don't watch, you know, we don't watch live TV, uh, not live TV. We don't watch, you know, TV, whatever. Yeah. Um, but I still get letters to this day. Every so often, they're going to be in the area on such and such a date. They never come. Yeah. Yeah. I don't get anything. I've no, not had anything for, for over two and a half years. Yeah, I mean, I'm not worried about it because, yeah. you know, the BBC is falling apart at the seams anyway. They've got, they've got no authority. They've got no powers whatsoever. No. We all used to think they had some bloody detector in the van, didn't we? <laughs> it was a great blag, though, weren't it? It was a great Everyone blag. Everyone fell for it. Yeah, we did. It was a proper great blag. Um, I mean, on that front, see, people shouldn't stop paying the, the, their bills because they think they're going to get away with it. What for, for me, when I found out about what the crap was with the TV license and all the scandals that they've had, you know, the, the biggest one, obviously, Jimmy Savile, right? This That latest one, that news presenter has just come out, hasn't it? That Hugh few. Edwards. Yeah, Hugh Edwards. And it wasn't about getting away with not paying. When I started found, finding out about this stuff, I was thinking, what? Mm. So, you know, for, 49 years of my life, I've believed in something and it's all it's all of those shit. Mm. You know, it's even like the, the government having no authority, the police force having no authority, the judicial system, they have no authority over us, mm. none whatsoever. But it's the mindset that we've been put into that belief. And do you know one of my favourite films that I've probably watched so, so many times, I can even quote stuff off it, was The Matrix. I used to love The Matrix. Yeah, absolutely. And that's exactly, not obviously carbon copy, but it's exactly what we're living in. We believe something... Okay, but why do we believe that? And this is this is why, you know, I question everything now. You know, which is like your podcast is about is being unsettled. I I can't believe anything without looking into it and researching. I even got well, I'm still the same now. If I like food products, I buy food products and I look what's in it. Yeah, you know, just the other week, never made a crumble in my life. Yeah, but I've just got an allotment, so I'm gonna, you know, prepping it all so I'll grow my own food next year. And some guy in the allotment gave me some rhubarb. Well, I went and picked some blackberries out the back. And I thought, right, we're going to do a crumble. Let's, we got down the shop and we picked up a bag of ready-made crumble that you could just take home, take it out of the bag, on it goes. Yeah. Yeah. And I looked at it and it's got rapeseed oil, palm oil, all this crap in it. Probably insects all, as well. Eh? Probably insects as well now. Yeah. All this shite in it. And then if you're going to make your own, bit of butter, flour, Put some oats on the top, job done. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's not difficult not... to make crumble, no. No, exactly. But it's just a, a simple example of food 
you know, I mean, I was, ne you know, I was never into looking at food the way I look at food now, and I certainly don't eat processed crap. I don't buy me meat from the um, supermarkets anymore. You know, I always get it from the butchers. I even get my eggs from the farm. Do you know what I mean? So even on the food front. And the things with the chemtrails, it's just one thing after one rabbit hole after another. And then when you mention things like that to you know the normie, oh yeah, they're spraying the skies. What? What are you on about? We well, see them lines in the sky. It's not normal, is it? Yeah, it's a play. Well, it's it's a contrail. you, It's a contrail. yeah, if you've been around since I've been around, even from a kid growing up, when we had summers, we had summers where we had blue skies, just blue, for a good week, or maybe a couple of weeks, where it's just blue skies, no no clouds. No lines in the sky. There certainly weren't no lines in the sky. No. Or these vibrating clouds. You know, when you get this sort of shape of like it's um uh like a, a wave. Wavy, yeah. Clouds like a wave shape. Mm. We know where that's coming from, but you talk to the normie about it, they're they're just so so locked in. You know, like in the matrix, they're so locked into it that they, they, they can't come out of it. Yeah, it's like what what I've been gobsmacked about really is they would they would prefer to continue the lie than to admit to themselves they've been lied to exactly yeah or they've been fooled and the thing is i was fooled I, I used to believe a lot of you know the normal stuff um yes i've always been a bit of a rebel yes i've always been a bit of an outlier yes i've always seen through things But not to the extent that I was like slapped in the face in 2020. You know, yeah my my rude awakening was the Janet Ossenberg, um videos, which were all about adrenochrome and the elite and 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 everything that was going on there. And I I felt absolutely sick to my stomach. You know, I remember it clearly. Sat in my lodge working and having to just take myself out for a walk, and like, what the actual fuck yeah is this? This can't. surely to god this can't be true you know and that that was really how i got blown wide open and like you said it it goes from one to the other to the next to the next to the next and and my ex who whether he ever listens to this um he never had the jab because i was so against it because he said he probably would have ended up just he's never had a jab in his life he doesn't believe in the flu shot and all the rest of it but because Yeah. everybody was doing it And he was in the normie world. He probably would have gone and got it, got it done. Yeah. Um, so you're welcome. Um, but the rest of it is like, he was just like, not everybody's a paedophile. Not everybody that works for the BBC or works in the NHS is a fucking paedophile. And I, I used to say, that's not what I'm saying. It's Yeah. the people, it's the people at the top. You know, it's those people that it, it's so corrupted, but he could not believe that it was as big as I was saying it was. Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent, and it's the same in, in in all the industries, isn't it? Those at the top know, but those underneath, they're just doing their job, and they're scared of doing that. You know, scared of losing their jobs. You know, I mean, a little example of that, which is coming away from the adrenochrome and stuff, but it's like, you know, look look how much solicitors are paid. Yeah, they're on good money, two hundred pound an hour, whatever. Now they've got to protect the bar, and they they swear an oath to the bar, don't they? And once they're settled and they're in there and they're earning that sort of money, you know, if there's any chance that they're going to lose that money, they're like, no, nah, I'm not I'm not losing that sort of pay. What am I going to go to? Earning twenty, thirty thousand pound a year when I'm earning that a month. Exactly. Do you know what I mean? So you know that they 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 basically conform and do as they're told. And this is it with every industry. The government, who are the corrupt ones, that are being, um, their puppet mastered. Yeah. So they've got their People above them telling them what to do. Um, and they're the ones putting out the education system for our kids, the teaching system, what they're doing for medicine, you know, the, what the doctors and nurses are being taught, how to deal with illnesses and whatnot. Um, then you've got the legal system, solicitors are, are, are taught um, their education, and it's all controlled by the, controlled by the government. I mean, I've got a, a couple of friends who are sol solicitors, And when I've sent stuff to one particular one, um, never answers me. And I know why she don't answer. I know, I know why she doesn't. And then I've got another lad who's looked into stuff and he's come back and gone, oh, yeah, that's actually true. I mean, there's a podcast that's gone out today with peacekeepers and there's something on there where a solicitor 
it it took a bit of persuading, but she was weren't having any of it at first. Um, wasn't listening to this guy. Look, this is how you got to represent me. This is what you got to say. Um, and in the end, the solicitor did the right thing. Um, and he got off it, and he said, if that's if I'd have gone if I'd have gone with the solicitor. What the solicitor wanted me to do initially, I'd be I'd be in prison. I'd be in the nick. So if it wasn't for her, you know, she we turned it around and she did what I asked her to do, and she was, you know, gobsmacked. And she was going After to listen, I haven't listened to it in, in its in, entirety yet, but but when you listen to that, it just it just shows you all these systems are corrupt because the education of these systems are coming from the very people that want us to be dumbed down, uneducated, and not know what our rights are. What the best thing is for for our health? I mean, you, you, you know, I know I'm jumping around a bit here, but when you talk about uh, cannabis, now I don't smoke cannabis, I don't take cannabis, but cannabis is good uh, for a lot of uh, illnesses. Yeah, Yet they've suppressed it and made it illegal. Well, it's a natural, it's a natural plant. Um, I'm going to do a James Delling poll and just um, go off camera and sort my blinds out because my yeah, face, mine's my face starting is to do getting that a redder bit. and redder. As well, yeah. But keep talking. <laughs> yeah, I'm um because I'm having some work done in the house. House, um, I'm not in my usual place. So, All right. right. Yeah. So, so yeah. So just stuff like that, you know. Everyone's so not everybody, but people are so dumbed down to the routines and what they're used to getting their information from, and people are just too bloody lazy. to go and do a bit of research themselves and get out of the normal routine. I remember my mother-in-law saying to me, well, not to me, saying to me, to me, Mrs. Is, um, is Mick having a breakdown? And who knows, I might have been, do you know what I mean? But um, I, I'm, glad, I'm, glad, I'm glad I am where I am. I mean, when we first met, or when I first had any contact with you, I was in Spain with my daughter um, and my missus, and you, you'd sent me um, those texts. And what prompted me to, to help you was just purely the fact because, you know, I feel compelled to do it because people are being shafted all the time. That's why I do the group, to teach people this stuff and help people out. But people have got to get to that point where they're like, now I wasn't confident in doing it. I had to I had to do it to get confident. Do you know what I mean? Um, and that's why I teach people so they can learn it and they can try it themselves. Do you know what I mean? Start off... Um, to challenge whether it's water, gas, electric, council tax, banking system, whatever. Start off first by protecting your assets. And that's what I did initially. Um, you know, I just made sure I got everything out of my name and I don't own anything. And that's what I did. So they can't come after me. I mean, they can come after me, but there's nothing that they can take from me that I own. Yeah. Yeah. So just for clarity here, um, you know, we all know that the rich and the elite and all the rest of it, they have trusts, especially old money. You hear about these family trusts and all the rest of it. And um, somehow these very rich people never pay much tax and or inheritance tax and everything else. And so these properties, especially the old properties, get passed down for centuries, really. And you think it's uh, you think a trust is is there just for the the people that have got money, and it's not true. The trust is there for anyone and everyone, exactly. and that, that's something that me and Mick have both discovered over the last couple of years. Um, it's as simple as drawing drawing up a private trust, putting in your assets, and uh, protecting them. Because Mick knows more about this than me, but you have something called trust law, and you can't mess with trusts. No, no. So when people worry about losing their house, lol, um, and uh, losing cars or them getting clamped, whether it be outside your house or whatever, you know, there are so many things that, that we can do that you can do. You can take back your power. Um, you just need to know your lawful rights. And I got into this. I actually started dabbling around in this back in... 2009 believe it or not because I got myself into a right old friggin mess I bought some I bought some uh property in the UK with my brother back in 2003 and um and then in 2007 I bought two apartments in Spain um 
And it was, I lost my dad in 2006 and it was a dream of my mum and dad's to have a place in Spain. That's, that's what was driving it. I never wanted to can buy anywhere in Spain, but that was, that's what was driving it. And, uh, I was stupid. Um, we were stupid and it was just before the economic crash. So needless to say, you know, I've talked about this a few times. Um, it all went tits up. We got screwed over in, in many, many ways. And, but it put me into a place of nearly going bankrupt back then. I had to, the, the advice that I got at the time was keep treading water, keep doing what you're doing, you know, and that's what I was doing. I was treading water to make sure that I wasn't going to lose the UK properties. Anyway, I got through it. Um, but th in that journey, I'd ended up with a lot of debt and I'd got car finance and this, that and the other. And then I somehow what came into my vicinity was this guy called Carl Wright. I don't know if you ever heard of him. Yeah. And he started this company called uh, Cartel Client Review. And it was all about calling out the contracts, the mortgages, credit cards, loans. They're all fraudulent. Yeah. So he set up this organization. It was up in Manchester. He ended up with this massive office building. And then one floor of it was solicitors. I ended up becoming a... Uh, commission only rep and um, put my own stuff through and put other people's stuff through. And then basically what happened was the Solicitors Regulation Authority and the F, the Financial Conduct Authority, so, yeah, yeah. they ended up um, freezing all his assets. And um, so he couldn't pay the solicitors. And this this was the story that was coming down. And so therefore the company ended up folding, et cetera, et cetera. Now he was made out to be a shyster and a con artist. And I didn't know enough. And so I thought he's a shyster and he's a con he's artist. A con artist yeah. And now when I think back to it, I'm like, no, he was outing the fraud and they, they shut him down and they got him good and proper. Yeah. So I sort of started to look into this and there was a get out of debt free.org. I'm sure. Yeah. You, yeah. So I started to get into all of that. But because the legalese and everything that you have to get your head around is so fucking complicated and it's not my bag, it's not my natural state because I'm very right brain, not left brained. Um, I just shied away from it. I would dip in, I would understand a little bit and then I'd come away and I'd sort of try a bit. You know, I've, I've been in court. I don't think I've told you this. Uh, three times, two with BMW and one with HSBC. <laughs> Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> what was that um, for car finance? Yeah. 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 Um, and a credit card. So, uh, and needless to say, um, didn't go in my favor. But um, so, yeah, so I've dabbled with it for a long time. And I wish now that I'd put more time and effort into it back then. Yeah. But it is what it is, right? But once once you start to understand the fraudulence of everything, you you can't go back. You like literally you can't unknow what you know. And if you're yeah. if you're a person that values integrity and honesty and authenticity and and freedom, freedom of speech, which is uh, slipping away at the moment, then you have to stand up and and say, "Hang on, this ain't this ain't happening. This ain't good enough." Mm. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, talking about the the banking stuff there. Um, the civil procedure rules, for example, which might have helped you in your claim against the, you know, your um, the driving or yeah. is it your, your loans and stuff? Yeah, BMW, um, yeah. Yeah. So, so for for me, I I had a loan for a car, um, and it was with uh, Sains Sainsbury's Bank. And when I found out about the the money systems, the monetary system, and I, I listened to that Richard uh, Weiner. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, a global co communist talking about how money works, money creation, and stuff like that. And I was like, "What? Mm. What do you mean the banks don't lend money?" Yeah. Uh, then I met allegedly Dave. Uh, went to a couple of his seminars, and I thought, "Right, I'm not having this." Now, initially, I was going to challenge the mortgage, but then I thought, two kids, do I want to push myself that far?" And then I'd seen what's happened with other lads, uh, for you know, for where it goes. You know, and I don't. I didn't want to put my family through that. Do you know what I mean? To that, to that point. But I thought, right, I'll learn a little bit here. 
and uh, I'll send a, a notice off to Sainsbury's Bank about my loan. So I'll send off the notice uh, with X amount of questions, just a notice of clarification, to clarify a few points. Um, and I did say in it, I'll withhold payment until you can answer these points and clarify and then I'm happy to carry on paying. And funny enough, it came back, as expected. Um, you know, none of the points were answered. Because if they do answer them, they just admitting that they actually haven't lent me any money. Mm. Uh, and that I'm the creation of that money that they've lent through my signature. Yeah. Or I give them a promissory note. Um, and so I went and I knew the procedure. You know, I'd learned what the procedure was, which, which, which was basically if you stop paying, they're going to give you three months. Because at the end of the three months, they're going to cash in on the insurance policy that they've got out on you that you don't know. Yeah. So, and after the three months, once they've cashed that in, then they're going to sell your data to a debt collection agency. Yeah. Along with every whoever else is in default. So, the debt collection agencies are then obviously you're going to pursue. So they maybe bought your data for I don't know, hundred quid. Now they're coming after you for six grand. Yeah. So it's a win-win for them. The banks have won because they never lent you any money anyway. Yeah, now they're just cashing on the insurance policy. And that promissory note that you gave them, which was your contract, which they securitized, they sold that. Mm. So the banks are a win-win. So when I sent that clarification in, I then sent another one, which was basically saying, listen, you haven't answered here, but I'm going to give you another opportunity uh, to cure this situation and not, you know, so a dispute doesn't develop. And they didn't answer that. So then I sent in a notice of non-response. And guess what? They didn't respond to it. So then I put in an affidavit. Now, it's funny because when I spoke to a lawyer, one of my friends, he said, oh, affidavits don't mean anything in court. That's what that's what he said to me. Oh, this is the trained solicitor? Yeah, yeah, trained solicitor. He said, affidavits don't matter in court. Yeah. Well, they do matter in court. 100% they do. Same as maxims in law matter, etc. So anyway... I got my affidavit, sent it in, and Sainsbury's Bank basically, uh, what you know, they they did what I knew they were going to do, uh, sent this uh, debt agency to come after the money, and in the meantime, I thought, right, you won't give me any clarification, you're not answering anything, right? So what I'm going to do now, you haven't answered my affidavit, that time's up, and after the affidavit, after the 30 days, I'll just send another one, seven days, give you another opportunity to answer the affidavit. They didn't do it, so I've done enough. So then I put a claim in, okay, using the CPR rules, I put a claim in against the um, the CEO of the bank, which was uh, Jim Brown, asking for my promissory note back. So the original contract that I, you know, that I signed to set that up, set up the, uh, the, the loan, I want that back. Um, so it was, I put an M1 form in for, um, eight grand, obviously plus costs. So it cost me 455 quid to start the claim. Uh, plus I think it was 8% or something like that, uh, interest. So anyway, I went through that. I went through that. Now they, or he, Jim Brown, he hired a solicitor, TLT, and they basically come back and they said, uh, I'm, I'm suing the wrong person because I haven't got a contract with Jim Brown. The contract is with. Uh, okay. Let me just get these dogs in. Hey, you can come in with me. So, um, he's <laughs> So, so yeah. So, <laughs> shh. Hey, oi, be quiet. So, so then, uh, sorry, he's put me off. So you can't, you can't, Jim Brown. Oi. Yeah, I'm ready. Right, hopefully they're going to be quiet now. <laughs> yeah, so they basically said I'm suing the wrong person, and it's Sainsbury's Bank that I I have the uh, the loan with, and not Jim Brown. So then I basically sent them a notice back. Um, so I followed it with the court, and then obviously served them with the notice. And I basically said Jim Brown, he holds principal uh, title of Sainsbury's Bank. It's his responsibility for the banking practices. I cannot sue. Sainsbury's Bank as it's a dead entity. Mm. I cannot bring Sainsbury's Bank into a court. But Jim Brown holds full responsibility for the banking practices. 
so I'm holding him responsible. All my notices went to Jim Brown. I even stamped on it, you know, private and confidential, not only on the documents, but also on the envelope. So if you've got agents within your banking system open somebody else's mail, you need to deal with that. Yeah. So um, they kept basically arguing the fact that it's Sainsbury's Bank. And I think they put like a, I can't remember what it's called now, a acknowledgement of servicing, but on behalf of Sainsbury's Bank. Well, sorry, I'm not suing them. It's Jim Brown. So then I put in, I think it's uh, CPR Rule 12.1, I put in a uh, request for a summary judgment because Jim Brown hasn't answered. He's had 14 days for an acknowledgement of service and he hasn't done it. So summary judgment, please. And they give it me. So that meant Jim Brown of the same as paying the CEO, he got a CCJ mm. to pay me eight grand plus costs. Now, that's a win in my eyes. You yeah. know, I'm not bothered about the money. It's just I have that, I have that document where the... Little old me from Coventry and Wiking is give the you know major bank CEO a bloody CCJ. So obviously their solicitors put a um, a set aside order in, um, and then there was a hearing down Central London County Court um, for three hours. Uh, and then I just thought to myself, right, if I go down there, I'm going to lose a day's pay. Going to cost me to go down there, and I can't see because of what I know about the judiciary system. I can't see that judge siding with me. Yeah? No, no so, in a million years. Yeah, so I just put a discontinuance in. I just ended it. Um, but if I had the money, I'd have gone through with that and I'd have gone down and probably had a bit of fun doing it. But it wouldn't have been fun coming away with, you know, with a three grand cost order. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. I'd never bothered, so I just did a discontinuance. And then the, the enforcement agents that were chasing me for the money for savings, but I sent them one notice and got rid of them. No, they haven't got a legally... Uh, execute deed of assignment. There's no novation agreement. So where are you going to go with this? And they just they just finished it. You know they sent a, a notice back saying that they, they they won't pursue the claim any longer. So that's done. You know, but it was going through that process of learning. I mean, I'm no expert on CPR rules, no no expert whatsoever. But you know, it's just knowing the basics and then putting that in and practicing it and just having a go at it and not worrying about it. I mean. Yeah. You know, when I found out about this with the money, I ended up right. Okay, I want to get a few credit cards. I've got to watch what I'm saying on here, but you know, <laughs> I, uh, I had a good time for a year, and then I thought, right, I've only, I've only spent my own money. You're not you're not getting anything out of me. You know I, know. I, mean? I know people that don't understand it. They're like, oh, you just want something for nothing. You've always just wanted something for nothing, and um, you know, you're the problem because you know you're creating all of these issues and this, that, and the other. And it's like. You try and get across to them. No, it's not that. It's not that. It, it's the it's the whole fuckery of the whole system, you know. And it's only, yeah. I mean, I I know even I know probably a tenth of what you know, Mick. Um, but what changes things is exactly what you've just said. Taking the action and learning as you go along, and not being scared of the consequences. Now, some of the consequences are scary. Like I'm. I'm in a scary spot right now, but do you know what? Since um, the last probably month of meeting a certain person and understanding about void orders and things like that when it comes to court, I feel very zen. I feel a lot more zen than I did a few months ago about mm. the possibilities. And obviously I've seen you in court. Well, I didn't get to see you in court, but I've I've I saw what came out of court, <laughs> and you were you weren't in there very long, that's for sure, no. because the judge just shit himself and ran off basically, because when you start standing up for common law and the constitutional law, and you know your rights as a human sovereign being, and not human, as a living man or a living woman that yeah. is sovereign, um, and you start talking that language as opposed to their language and going into their jurisdiction, which is what they want, because then they've got you. Um, and this this might not make sense to some people that are listening, but if it doesn't make sense and you're curious, then you can reach out to either me or Mick or go and look on YouTube or maybe not YouTube, maybe Rumble or somewhere like that to get more information about this. Because as a living man or a living woman, we are we are the the top of the the tree if you like but we yeah. just we've just been told we're not exactly 
Exactly, and I, I'm, I'm talking about more, more, more of this all the time. Mm. It's the people that has the authority, you know, not not the monarch, not the government, not the judiciary. The only time that they have any authority over you is if you've committed a crime, if you cause harm, loss, or yeah. injury to another being, you know, Empire another enough. man or woman. Yeah. Then they have authority over you. Until that day, they don't have jack shit over you. Mm. You know, oh well, they've created a law. Yeah, and. Well, if they created a statute or an act, I was going to say it's well, not a law, is it? Statute, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, it, they don't. Cr a, a, a statute it requires consent. Now, there's 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 a lot of case law going back in the history where that's come out in court cases. You know, there's no no man can put his will on another. So these people, these 650 MPs in this country. What, so they're they're type they're dictating to seventy million people. I don't think so. Mm. And the the latest one, Keir Starmer, who's been elected on nine and a half, just over nine and a half. Um, sorry, oh. sorry, you just said he's been elected. Well, <laughs> yeah, over nine, but he only had nine and a half million votes out of seventy. I mean, I don't vote because I'm sovereign and I don't need somebody to tell me what to do. So I make my own decisions. Again, as long as I don't do harm or loss or injury to anybody, you know. Leave me be about my own business. It's as simple as that. Um, and I realise, and you realise as well, you know, with this slave system that's been put in, put in place, it is hard to get out of. And this is why you we have to learn to be in it when we want to be in it and be out of it when we want to be out of it. Yeah, absolutely. And, that, and that's the hard thing to, uh, to learn. And, you know, I've always, I mean, I'm early in the game, 2021 stroke two, and... You know, when people talk about the Sescovy Act and all that, you know, we've got it, this trust and all this sort of stuff, but we can't access it. It's not ours. We didn't create it. Do you know what I mean? It's somebody else's, um, but they're dipping in and using this money. And I always have this element of doubt, you know, about being the, um, you know, there is a straw man, you're representing it. But when I did that court case last week, that's nailed it for me. 100% mm. nailed it. That, because... The district judge, he didn't even bat an eyelid. When I told him who I was, I'm so, Michael. Okay, let's just do clarity here. Um, so um, am I okay to say why you were in court? Yeah, 100%, yeah. yeah okay, bothered, so, yeah, yeah. so basically he's um, stopped paying his council tax because um, he and I believe that council tax is not being uh, used in the way that the good common man and woman believe it's being used. And it's actually collected centrally with the central government and it's being used to fund wars, terrorism, trafficking, human trafficking. And this all sounds so far fetched, but it's not when you start digging into it. So yeah, so Mick has stopped paying his council tax um, and so have I, so my cat's now come to join the party. And, um, and sorry, yeah, and so that's why Mick was in uh, court last week, not for the first time. And when you know how to represent yourself as the sovereign living man or woman and what language to use and don't let them take uh, jurisdiction, uh, I'll let Mick continue with that. But but before you do, Mick, the Ke the uh, Kescovy Trust is all to do with the birth certificate. We don't need to get yeah. into that now, but... Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's so a long topic, isn't it? Yeah. It is a long topic, but yeah. So if you want to just finish your story about, you know, that validation well, any, that you got. Yeah, well, if anyone's watching and, and, the, and they've never thought about council tax or challenged it. So if you're paying your council tax, I'll ask you a, a question. If you knew that money that you're paying is actually um, funding wars and contributing to killing innocent women innocent children, innocent, innocent men in foreign countries, would you still pay it? Just think about it morally. Forget about the scare tactics that if I don't pay it, this is going to happen. Just morally think, if it came to light that that's where your money's going, or you're contributing to killing innocent people of this planet, would you still pay it? Simple as that. And that's why I'm not paying it. Mm. Yeah, until they can prove to me that, that the money's not going uh, to fund wars. Now, my notices going in over the last two years, they haven't answered and they won't answer because no. they know morally, um, you know, you don't pay money to kill innocent women and children in foreign foreign countries. But that's what's happened. That's where the money's going. And it's easily proven. Now, 
last year I spoke to a guy called Andrew Stinton, which is the um, the revenues enforcement manager at Coventry City Council. And I've had a long conversation, which I've got recorded. Okay, he stated in it. Listen, it's a tax, and you've got to pay it. You know, it doesn't it doesn't matter about your services. It all goes to it all goes to the treasury, right? So when I, when you think about that, he's telling me it's not going to local city. It goes to the treasury, okay? So when they're telling you a council's going bust, say Birmingham County last year going bust, right? How can they go bust if they're getting all their money from the treasury? Yeah. Just means the treasury got to give them more money. So I believe it's all BS. Just so the council has the excuse to put the council tax up an extra 6% the following year or 10% the following year or whatever. Exactly. But it, but it's going to fall down because when they do that, they put up an extra 5%, 10%, whatever. You probably just put an extra a couple of hundred thousand into the same pot where a lot of people are, where they genuinely can't afford to pay it. Mm. And then when they come on the news and they say, you know, uh, the, the government are telling people, you've got to make your council tax a priority payment. What, before food, before yeah. gas and electric, before I'm heating my house for my kids? Put council tax first. Or go and swivel on that. Yeah. So they've they've admitted to me at this council that the money doesn't go to local services. And we know, like, police forces, they're all uh, registered to a foreign state, i.e. Duns and Bradstreet. They've all got their own uh, corporated numbers, okay? They're not public bodies anymore. The same as the courts. They're all not public bodies anymore. But just going back to the council tax. So if people start challenging it, get your knowledge first, protect all your assets, and it, and then stop them from getting away with it. Mm. Yeah? It's your hard-earned cash. It's your hard-earned money. Why should you be paying for wars or towards wars where you know morally you wouldn't do it? So why are you paying? Because you're scared. Well, Look, get educated, protect your assets, drop the fear, and then tell them where to go. Simple as that. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds simple. Um, unfortunately, it's not for a lot of people. Um, and I was thinking about when you were talking about the, you know, the the lawyers, the barristers, and all people like that who um and the, the high ups in whatever organization, and they know. They get to a point where they know it's morally wrong, but they can't do anything about it or they feel like they can't do anything about it because, yes, they're earning a certain amount of wedge, but they've also got all of these responsibilities and commitments in this big house and probably maybe a mortgage and and then private school for the kids and, you know, and all of these things. And that's how they get you. That's how they keep you trapped in the system because you know damn well the day that you stop feeding all of that, it's all going to come crashing down. Um, and you know, they try and scare you with a bad credit score and whatever else it might be. Uh, yeah, I know you had it uh, recently and I'm like, I don't give a, I don't give a fuck anymore about my credit score <laughs> because yeah. that yeah. just keeps you trapped in a system that you don't want to be in. Exactly. Exactly. Well designed. <laughs> well designed to keep the fear strong. Yeah. Exactly. So we've gone way over um, the hour. Um, so and it's a Friday night, so I'm going to let you go, Mick. But I would uh, love for you to finish with anything based on everything we've shared and you've shared. Anything you feel called to share to the, the listeners and the viewers as a final parting gift, if you like. Well, I'll end on a couple of things. The first one is don't. Don't feel afraid to think outside the box and go against the narrative, you know, the normal narrative, what the BBC is telling it and what all your friends believe. Do your own research. Be your own person. Think for yourself. Make decisions for yourself. Yeah? And do the right thing morally. Yeah? If seven, if you find out seven trent water are poisoning your water with chemicals, okay, whether it's intentionally or not, and they're expecting you to pay for that, just think about it morally. You know, if I if I offer you a product and I'm you know and you find out it's poisonous and I'm still requiring that payment, are you going to pay me? So why would you pay them? Mm. I haven't paid seven Trent now for two and a half years. Threatened court action three times. Never been in court with them yet. I'd love to go into court with them, but not been in once. So you know, you educate yourself. And I know it's difficult because you have a routine like I used to have: coming in, having your dinner, watching the telly, or watch on Netflix. 
I've got no interest in any of that more. I have more p power now than what I've ever had. If somebody had said to me when I first started this journey, back on that stand in the park when somebody was going to court for a PCN, and they said, Nick, in two years' time, you're going to walk into a court and a district judge is going to run away because of your knowledge. I'd have said, don't be mad. Yeah. And that's exactly where the levels people can get to. you just got to realise these, the, these people that are acting on behalf of these corporations, they're just normal people. Yeah. That's all they are, normal people. Normal people like me and you that have been scared into, you know, their own responsibilities and then feel like they're just doing a job to keep the roof over the head and feed the kids exactly. and dun, 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 dun. And, the, and these groups are growing. Uh, if you know, I'll give them a I'll give them a bit of a plug. So you've got you know Bannerman. Go on to Bannerman's uh, YouTube channel. And have a look what's happening in these communities where the corrupt banks are coming to take people's houses back, and the communities are coming together and they're stopping it happening. Now they're not stopping it happening because they're letting these people try and get away with not paying. Okay, they're stopping the banks from taking the house back because it doesn't belong to them. They haven't lent them any money. Yeah. And this is what you've got to learn and understand. Just watch a bit of uh, Richard w uh, Weiner. Find out who he is. Listen to what the guy's saying, and you'll realise we're being, you know, we're being the uh, rough shot all the time. You know, we're being lied to on every aspect in our life. Yeah, seriously, absolutely. Um, yeah. what? Just before we go, what if somebody wanted to reach out to you directly, Mick? What's the easiest way they can do it? Well, that's a good. Is, question. is there a way? Because I, I tried to stay in the private. <laughs> All right. Okay. We'll forget that one. I'll edit that yeah. one out. <laughs> so I don't really give emails, but if somebody's really desperate to get in touch, if they get in touch with you, and you can pass a message on. I mean, I do get some people contact me, contact me through other people, and they say, oh, "I've had this, I've had that." And if I can help them out, I will. I mean, I had um, I had a couple of people this year that they had these um, driving offences, which is they're putting all these cameras about. Yeah. Um, and they was they sent pictures saying you did this which was um, undue care and attention. And it's just a picture of their car, a couple of pictures, but there's no evidence there. No. Okay. So on, on one of them, you know, who asked me for the help, I told them what to do, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and they didn't do anything about it. They ended up just paying the, the fine. Yeah. And then somebody else who, took, who basically called to me for the same type of thing, but it was for making a left turn where they weren't allowed to make a left turn. I told them what to write, et cetera, et cetera. And they did it. And, th and then they come back where that's it. The claim's finished. I think it was two notices, but the claim's finished. And the reason why I like helping people, because the more of us know about this, the more of us realise not just our power, but, you know, we have laws that protect us, but we just don't get taught them. No. Because it keeps us in the slavery. So let's share our experiences, share our successes you know, and eventually it's all going to crumble. It's all going to collapse. Yeah, I, I have a feeling there's going to. Well, I think I think the finance system is 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 imminent, um, given everything that's I've seen been going on the last few weeks. But I, I think the back end of 2024 is where things are really going to either just go off the stratosphere in terms of craziness yeah. um, or collapse, collapse yeah. properly. Um Maybe it'll be early 25 before we start to see some brightness from that. I don't know. Yeah. But... but you know, Mal, when when they talk about these CBDCs and the digital ID and stuff like that, right? If they bring that in really quick, people are gonna people are gonna know, hold on, that's what my life was like last year or two years ago. This is what my life what my life is like now. I'm not I'm not having it. Mm. And it's civil war. Yeah, well, that that's kind of the rumblings going on now, but that's um, I don't like that because that's what they want, really. So I, I would like more of people to stand up like we are and do it, do it lawfully and peacefully. I, th I think civil war wouldn't be a bad thing. I think you have to. I think I think personally, we're going to have to get to that to stop these elites and take the government down. But what's happened is these little plays that they're doing now is dividing the community yeah, so we're yeah. fighting against each other but muslim brothers christian brothers catholic brothers sisters you know we all come together we're yeah. more powerful than what we what we realize yeah. but that's why the narrative with the government and the media because they're in you know connivance together okay so 
you know, if people are listening to that, even like the other night, I think it was Wednesday night, there were supposed to be these 100 mass riots around the country. It didn't even happen. Yeah, it was bullshit, yeah. But the government was saying it, the media was saying it, so people are believing it. And even some people that haven't even been out on the streets or been anywhere probably think that took place, and it didn't. Yeah. Yeah. It's to separate us so we're not strong together as a community. Exactly, exactly. Right. But when, probably... but when we're all affected, man, when everybody's affected, because your council tax is through the roof, the rate, you know, your mortgage rates are through the roof, your gas electric, your water is through the roof, uh, through the roof. People are going to be at breaking point. Do you know what I mean? But it's unfortunate where people get involved. I mean, I can I can afford to pay my bills. I can afford to pay my council tax. I can afford it. Not it's not an issue. But I'm not going to morally. I'm not going to pay them because I know it's wrong. Mm. And if I if I know it's wrong, I'm not going along with it. Yeah. You know, and if anybody needs help, let them get in touch with you and, you know, I don't mind chatting with people when I have the time. Yeah. Or come to the Sovereign Project. Yeah. Yeah. Mick runs a, a Sovereign Project on a Tuesday night in Coventry. I mean, obviously, this is very local to Coventry right now. Yeah. Um, But, um, yeah, if you're I will put um, I'll put a link in anyway on the show notes and um. Yeah, if you're interested, then just reach out on Wikipedia. Right, and there, there are a lot of sovereign project shops around the country. So around it's not the country, just the yeah. you know, I think we, yeah. there's about 12, 15 all over the place. So, okay, cool. Well, well thank, thank you, Mick. Um, thank you for staying on uh, so long and a Friday night. I will now leave you to whatever uh, your Friday night holds for you. It's been dog walking. Dog walking. Um, it's been a, a real pleasure to get to understand a bit more of your story because I knew some of it, but I don't know. I don't know half of it. But yeah. So yeah, thank cool. you for sharing that and for giving me your time tonight. Really appreciate no it. Right.